Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Homage to the Blessed, Noble, and Perfectly Enlightened One Namo Sadanto Suchetoye Alakhadi Samya Samputoshe the unsurpassed, deep, profound, subtle, wonderful Dharma in a hundred thousand million eons is difficult to encounter. Now that I've come to receive and hold it within my sight and hearing, I vow to fathom the thus come ones true and actual meaning. And um, I, I, we're now going to chant the title of the sutra. We're on page 36. No, actually 37 and, and 36. So we're going to recite um, the sutra text on first in Chinese and then in English. In Chinese, um, we're continuing with the fifth ground, and we will be starting on Can 
you hear me? No? Okay. So we're going to start with the, um, in the Chinese, it's um, with the, the list of the ten truths. That's on the third line, the second character, san, san zhi su di, on page 36. Um, and we're actually going to, yeah, just read down to the end of that paragraph for now. Okay. San zhi su di, san zhi di yi yi di, san zhi xiang di, san zhi zi bie di, san zhi cen li di, san zhi shi di, san zhi sen di, san zhi jing wu shen di, san zhi ru dao zhi di, san zhi yi jie pu sa di, zi di cen jiu di. English. He skillfully knows worldly truth. He skillfully knows truth in the primary sense. He skillfully knows the truth of appearances. He skillfully knows the truth of discrimination. He skillfully knows the truth of setting things up. He skillfully knows the truth of phenomena. He skillfully knows the truth of creation. He skillfully knows the truth of no birth's end. He skillfully knows the truth of entry into the wisdom of the way. He skillfully knows the truth of successive accomplishment of all bodhisattva grounds up to and including skillfully knowing the truth of accomplishment of a thus come one's wisdom. Of course, I'd like to introduce um, Yang Fa Shi. Um, and she's here from the City of 10,000 Buddhas, um, just arrived a, f a little while ago, and um, we're really happy to have her here. She's one of our uh, senior bhikshunis and has um, nurtured the Sangha and also our education um, at systems at the City of 10,000 Buddhas through many years. Um, she also teaches a variety of classes and um, does many jobs from um, administrative down to working in the garden and Tai Chi. So, um, it actually has something to do with this chapter, so that's why I'm mentioning it. Okay, so she's going to start by introducing some general context of that. Yeah. Okay. So um, this is called the ground of difficult conquest. Um, Cleary um, translates this as the stage of difficult to conquer. And another translation that I've heard is the ground of difficult to overcome. So uh, some translators uh, use ground, other translators use stage. We prefer ground uh, because it's more poetic in a sense. It has more meaning for us. Um, so obviously this ground is difficult to accomplish. Uh, which is how it gets its name. Um, I'm going to start with just some news because it's a little bit related also to the text. So, uh, do we translate into Chinese? Yeah. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> so, recently I returned from Gold Buddha Monastery in Vancouver. Dharma Master Sher was also there. He was very busy um, and worked very hard. We had a grand opening of our um, new um, addition to our Buddha Hall. And um, he, uh, he and Dharma Master Lai transmitted the um, Three Refuges and Five Precepts. And um, uh, Dharma Master Sher transmitted the uh, Precepts for the Deceased, which is very popular. Um, and, uh, and the next day, we had the grand opening. Um, there was something called the opening of the light on the Bodhis Buddha and Bodhisattva images. Um, and 
uh, Dharma Master Sher also um, uh, gave a, what's called a shang tang. Um, it's a very formal, very, very formal form of sutra lecture or uh, Dharma talk, excuse me, um, which is, um, which is uh, very adorned. And what, how we say in Chinese, long zhong. I don't know how to pronounce it, to translate that into English. Dignified, very dignified and solemn. And then the boys' school came in. It was no longer dignified and solemn. It was very uh, lively. And they, um, they, con they uh, performed the lion dance with lots of drums. They closed off the street so that we could have the whole street to ourselves. And, uh, and there was a dragon dance. So it was um, very festive. And then following that, uh, there were about a 1,000 people attending. It was a very large crowd. <clears throat> And so following that, um, uh, there was an a Emperor La Liang repentance ceremony for a, about a week. The reason I'm bringing this up now is that um, the Emperor Liang repentance, um, at the end of each chapter, there were 10 chapters or 10, ten roles. And at the end of each role, um, the merit and virtue from practicing that dharma is transferred to one of the grounds. So we start with the first ground, the second ground, third ground. By the end of the repentance ceremony, we've dedicated our practice to all 10 grounds, to achieving all 10 bodhisattva grounds. Um, so the, the, the Avatamsaka Sutra is, uh, it, um, it permeates much of Buddhist literature and, and uh, liturgy. So if you've been following this series of lectures from the beginning, then you know that on each ground, the bodhisattva concentrates on a particular practice. So for example, the first ground, the ground of happiness, the bodhisattva especially uh, practices giving or renunciation. On the second ground, called the ground of leaving uh, filth, the bodhisattva concentrates on practicing the precepts. On the third ground, ground of emitting light, the bodhisattva specializes in practicing patience. On the fourth ground, the ground of blazing wisdom, the bodhisattva works on perfecting the quality of vigor. So now we're on the fifth ground. And on this ground, the bodhisattva practices the perfection of dhyana, meditation. So it has probably already been mentioned or even elaborated upon that the 10 grounds fall, um, also relate to the 10 bodhisattva paramitas or perfections. And so it follows that the practices on each of these grounds accords with a respective paramita. In this case, of course, the fifth paramita, the dhyana paramita. And it's by perfecting the dhyana paramita combined with having arrived at the previous paramitas on the previous grounds that one acquires the attributes and the skills that are being described in the text. And so today the text here describes 10 kinds of skillful knowledge that the bodhisattva realizes and can apply. Here again, we come across the number 10. So you've heard the number 10 throughout the Avatamsaka Sutra. There are lists of 10 in every chapter. So I suppose you all know what 10 signifies. Hmm? Completion. Hmm? Yes. Unity. Sarah? Okay. Uh, Yenman, yes. Uh huh. It also um, represents infinity because the number 10, can, you can add a zero to that number, add infinitum. And so these lists of 10 are representative, they're, they're sort of the tip of the iceberg. 
they're, they're sort of like uh, seeds of thought for us to contemplate. And each one of them, each individual one, is also infinite. And they also reflect upon each other. Uh, they relate to each other um, in, in very fascinating ways. And so uh, when we study the Avatamsaka Sutra, we don't study it as, a, you know, um, as if we were scholars uh, trying to sort of um, master and understand every word. Um, it's the beginning, the beginning of a lifetime of reflection and investigation. So, um, so now I'll attempt to just give a few simple words regarding the first item in this list. He skillfully knows worldly truth. So Cleary translates this as he is well versed in. Um, and there are other translations that he well knows. So it, uh, it's pointing to a, a very deep and complete, perfect understanding. So connecting this first skillful knowledge to the first sentence in the following paragraph that, that explains it a little. It says, since this bodhisattva accords with what delights the hearts of living beings and makes them happy, therefore he knows worldly truth. So what this points to is that this skillful understand, understanding of worldly or conventional truth is connected with understanding people, understanding living beings. In other words, conventional truth or worldly truth is conditional. It's not ultimate. It's not perfect. Some of the conditions that establish this truth are a, a, a living being's culture, language, environment, gender, age, generation, era that they live in, the historical time that they live in, their health, physical and mental, uh, political influences, and so on. It goes on and on. In Buddhist terms, this truth is conditioned by karma and by the five skandhas, and so on. So this truth is not ultimate. It is not primary. It is not universal. It is different for each individual person. So it is... It is it is human nature to seek the truth. It is a human compulsion to want to know. It is so strong that it can easily overcome one's moral sensibilities, the search for the truth. And this compulsion often seems to take precedent over every other consideration. We really want to know what's going on. And it's not only an individual compulsion, it's a, it's a man, it's the compulsion of mankind so that we want to go to the moon and find out what's going on there. We want to know everything. On the other hand, most of us suffer from the delusion that we already know, that we, we alone know the truth, that our truth somehow is more closer to the truth than everyone else's. This is a common ailment and is the cause of a lot of suffering because oftentimes my truth and your truth are not completely in accord. We see things differently. We understand them differently. We absorb experiences differently. We remember things differently. And based on those things, we, we believe that we know a, a certain truth and we believe that our truth is more correct than others. And what complicates it further is that our egos get intensely involved in this wanting to know the truth. So individuals pit themselves against other individuals 
groups against groups, societies against societies, countries against countries, and too often this leads to unrest, fighting, and even war. So we all need to feel that we understand what's going on. It is fundamental to our survival. Humankind survived so, for so many mm, millennia uh, because, we, because of our brains, because of what we know, what we understand. And if we feel that we don't know what's going on, we, become ex we feel extremely vulnerable and become very anxious. We are so afraid of being cheated. We are so afraid of being misled. We are so afraid of being in the dark. But the bodhisattva is above all this. The bodhisattva has achieved a state where his or her personal ego does not enter into things. And so the bodhisattva can see things very, very clearly, can see things as they really are and is completely at ease. And the Bodhisattva sees that all of our individual truths and why we, we have arrived, how we have arrived at these truths. He or she, the Bodhisattva, understands us completely without judging us. And since the Bodhisattva has this capacity he can sympathize with each living being's point of view while knowing that it is conditioned and that it is just one of many truths. And in doing this, he can bring us to recognize our own inherent truth, our own inherent goodness, our wisdom, and our, our Buddha nature, which is connected to the highest of truths. So this bodhisattva can reveal to each one of us who we are, what makes us tick, and use that to propel us on the road to bodhi. The bodhisattva can touch the heart and mind of each living being and, and make us happy in this way, and make us feel at ease, peaceful, and unafraid. And moreover, the bodhisattva can bring us all into a mutual accord and mutual understanding and a mutual acceptance. So I'll just say those words about this first one here, and then. So I'm going, this is a little random, but I first wanted to add to several things that Dharma Master Liang said. Um, so she mentioned that some of us prefer the translation of ground for the ten, these ten levels that the Bodhisattva passes through before reaching Buddhahood, because the Sanskrit is bhumi, and that means soil or earth, as a primary meaning. meaning and later it can be taken more metaphorically or abstractly as a, a stage or something. So um, because the ground is, uh, Nao Hashira also mentioned earlier that it's like we're operating in this environment. It's like the Windows operating system on our computer. So it's really, um, it's an all-encompassing kind of uh, state and environment that we are in when, we're, when we get to a particular ground. Um, and also has the metaphors of um, an agricultural metaphor of seeds that you can plant and so forth, and it's supporting. But, um, okay, and then another comment, she was talking about the compulsion to know, like scientific search for knowledge, and um, it's true that the Bodhisattva's way of obtaining uh, knowledge is different rather than searching externally, uh, the Bodhisattva search 
reflects inwardly and, and then can know everything. Um, I recently was at, in a course that we were studying how anatomical knowledge came to um, you know, be known by the medical field. And in the old days, of course, they always um, used the bodies of criminals and very low class people who um, either needed to be killed for a, a punishment or um, had no, you know, family didn't have any rights over their, their bodies, so they could find out more. Not necessarily for healing, the motivation was just to know about the body. And of course, we know that during um, the Nazi, um, the Nazis and the Japanese um, during those, the wars also used um, the, their prisoners, their captives, and dissected them and did lots of very cruel experiments on them, whether dead or alive. So um, that just illustrates the compulsion to know in a worldly sense can be ethical or can be unethical. Um, but the Bodhisattva um, cultivates dhyana on this, so it's a, an inward reflection that he or she can then apply in the world. This fifth ground is actually very um, special because um, it mentions how the Bodhisattva, having taken some time to retreat and leave the world, um, and can, is now going to come back into the world. Um, these ten grounds are also on a kind of parallel path with the four stages of arhatship. Um, and those of you who were studying the fourth ground might have noticed um, a, an emphasis on many of the dharmas that um, are cultivated to renounce the world, uh, to cultivate some kind of loathing for you know, material, mundane things. And the Bodhisattva has a strong desire to get out of samsara and to seek nirvana. So cultivation is a path where we are trying to um, subdue our afflictions and change our bad habits. And in order to do that, we have to sometimes withdraw from the world a bit and not be too engaged in it because then we don't have the time or the space to, to be able to detect and make a, make a conscious choice before we take an action because we're so hectically running about that words spill out of our mouth that we don't necessarily meant, mean to say and they already cause more um, maybe bad karma and destroy relationships um, before we know it. So that's why we have a monastery where um, some people you know, live full time and withdraw in a sense, but we'll it's not completely. And then other people come in for retreats for a cer certain amount of time so that they can take time to just look inwards and work on the mind. Um, at the same time, from the very beginning of this chapter, it mentions that a bodhisattva, while in this, while cultivating certain qualities inwardly, never forgets that the ultimate goal is to benefit all beings. So it may seem like very selfish to focus on yourself for a period of time, but this is only an in kind of an investment so that later you have greater strength and greater abilities to, to help others. And you have also more expedient knowledge and, and also more blessings, kind of like capital that you can use when you want to help more other beings. So it's a process, it's a balance of back and forth um, sometimes retreating and sometimes engaging. Um, but in the fifth ground, this Bodhisattva has, is going to learn to integrate um, the worldly truth with the, the next one, which is truth in the primary sense, which is an, an ultimate truth. Um, whereas the worldly truth is knowing all of these detailed phenomena in the world and all their differences. Um, and how, how they work, because these are very um, useful things to relate to other living beings and to do things in the world. 
but then truth in the primary sense is knowing that all of these things are empty of an intrinsic nature. They're also ephemeral and illusory, and so the bodhisattva can detach from them and see it all as empty. Um, that's basically what the second truth is about. Um, I wanted to say, well, maybe you want to go first on the third truth. So um, when I read this passage, what, what I remembered and what resonated with me was the aspect of um, knowing what makes living beings happy. Uh, and this is what enables the bodhisattva to, um, to have this uh, mundane, uh, this understanding of mundane truth which um, is, as uh, Yunvashir uh, said, um, it's empty. It's, it's not ultimate. It's changeable. And it's based on uh, non-reality. Um, but because the, the, the Bodhisattva understands what makes living beings happy and understands their minds and their natures and their hearts, um, he can engage with living beings and, um, and reveal to them uh, the emptiness of, of this. So uh, when, when he was in the world, when the Venerable Master was in the world, each and every one of us, of his disciples, we all had the same uh, belief and without any doubt that our teacher completely understood us even better than we knew ourselves. He could see into our minds and know what we were thinking and know what was in our hearts. But because he was free of an ego, uh, he, his ego was non-existent, so it didn't come into play. And we all felt completely at ease with his having this knowledge of us because we, we, were, we were sure and trusted that he had the very best interests um, of each and every one of us without discrimination at heart. And so we felt very comfortable with that. But that doesn't mean that we still didn't have disagreements among ourselves. Uh, we did, often. And at times, the Venerable Master would favor one of our truths over others' truths. And that was good for the others of us who thought we knew what the truth was because it gave us a pause to reflect upon our own truths that we were so stubbornly attached to and to question ourselves to look into our minds and to finally realize that my truth is no valid than anybody else's. That ultimately trying to establish who is right and who is wrong only produces affliction and confusion. In this way, the master taught us to have a big belly like Maitreya Bodhisattva. That is to develop an attitude of acceptance and tolerance uh, this did not mean that we abandon our own sense of what is true and false, what is right or wrong, because he also taught us to have what, what's called a zaifa yin, or a kind of spiritual ability to distinguish what is really going on. And in practical terms, he taught us to share our truths with each other and thereby tease out a greater truth a more universal truth. And the way he described this, he would say that an individual's wisdom is, is just a very small wisdom, but the group's wisdom is the Buddha's wisdom. So once we come together as a group and 
and listen to each other and consider each other's perspectives, we, come to, we can come to um, a much higher level of understanding. And so the coming together of people from different backgrounds and cultures, experiences and talents is a, a most rare and precious opportunity. If we can recognize this opportunity and make the most of it and resist the tendency to uh, uh, ally ourselves only with those who agree with us, then together we can reach a, a higher level of understanding. So. So that was, so that's one, one way of looking at combining the mundane truth with the uh, ultimate truth. primary truth in the primary yeah. sense. And that's actually for the fifth ground bodhisattva, the, the most difficult conquest that this bodhisattva has to overcome. It's um, to be able to combine them and maybe most of us probably feel a little bit comfortable with some parts of worldly truth because we learned that from when we were little in school and at home and just learning the conventions of our society and our culture. Uh, truth in the primary sense maybe is something really abstract to us right now. Um, what is the ultimate truth? Um, what is emptiness? Um, but if any of you have ever gone to a session or even spent a few hours here, you know, chanting the Buddha's name or meditating, you've probably had a taste of it when you are sitting there and you suddenly cannot remember where you are and that you have a body or something. Sometimes you have a split second of that kind of feeling of peace and maybe oneness or just that there are no discriminations and everything is perfectly fine. So when we, I know that when I get a chance to do sessions at s the City of 10,000 Buddhas, especially Chan session, um, there will be times when this happens. But then often when I leave the Buddha hall and go to the office or, or somewhere else where I have to meet people and talk with them because I'm not doing the session full time, I still have responsibilities. Then afflictions start arising because I start to discriminate again and to, because um, people are talking to me, I have to respond and, or figure out, make decisions. And it's very easy to feel like, I don't want to be doing this, I want to go back to the hall and continue that oneness. Um, so that's normally how it is for us. But this fifth ground bodhisattva is able to harmonize the two. Um, as Nao Hashi mentioned, the fifth ground bodhisattva is focusing on the cultivation of dhyana. And there's a phrase in the Song of Enlightenment uh, by the dhyana master Yongjia, um, Xing Yi Chan, Zuo Yi Chan, Yi Mo Dong Jing Ti An Ran, meaning walking is dhyana, sitting is dhyana. Speaking or silent, moving or still, you are at peace. So that bodhisattva is able to um, maintain that sense of oneness and emptiness even while doing business. And I think we, we have, of course, seen that example in our teacher um, where he is never ruffled and afflicted, um, even while teaching very recalcitrant human beings and all other kinds of beings, perhaps. Um, so, so this Bodhisattva is trying to harmonize the two truths and make them resonate with each other. Um, and, and then also National Master Qing Liang, or Sun Guan Fa Shi, also says that he overcomes two difficulties because in difficult conquest, it's the conquest of difficulties. And these difficulties have to, be, have to do with coming back into the world to teach beings. So the first one is meaning you're able to 
teach and exhort living beings without getting afflicted. If anyone has ever taught any children as a parent or as a teacher, you know that can be very difficult because um, as soon as the, um, you know, you have a room full of children, they all want to do whatever they want to do and um, it's very e easy to lose your patience and um, to, and sometimes when you have a troublesome child that, that disturbs the class, you're really grateful when that, that child is absent because then the class goes really well <laughs> and everyone's happy. So that's, the teachers, all teachers I think are bodhisattvas to some extent um, because they're trying to, to really um, spend their time and energy with young people and many of them. But um, it it's, can really be testing and it's a really good opportunity to cultivate, to see if you can go through the day no matter what happens with your kids and not get afflicted. And the second difficulty is adding on to that, not getting upset when living beings don't accord with your intentions. So you have all these good intentions to lead them into the Dharma if you're a Bodhisattva or to teach them math if you're a teacher or something. But they don't want to do that. <laughs> they want to go in the opposite direction and follow their habits. So the Bodhisattva still has to not get afflicted. And the reason that the fifth ground Bodhisattva can do that is because they have this truth in the primary sense. So they don't even see, they're, t they're trying to teach living beings, but they don't even see them as living beings. They're not discriminating that this is a living being because they know that it's everything is in flux and everything is impermanent. And also, at the same time, everything is part of your Buddha nature, so it um, shouldn't upset you. Um, so then, well, we're still in the part of the sutra, though, where it's talking about how he is um, developing his wisdom in regards to the different kinds of truths, um, infinitely many, although we have 10 here. And, um, and Tsang Guan Fa Shi also says that these 10 are actually just um, applied to the four truths that were discussed last week. Um, so the, the worldly truth is um, just seeing the different characteristics of the four truths suffering and the arising of suffering and, and then the cessation of suffering and the path to cultivate that. And, and then using those characteristics to use the four truths to bring happiness to living beings. Um, and usually you have, when living beings are not mature in the Dharma, meaning they don't understand the Dharma, they're not inclined to the Dharma, then you use a lot of worldly truth to teach them. You don't use terms, Buddhist terms, but you, you use um, you know, worldly skills and wor worldly knowledge to get them to see truths that are, you could say are dharma, but they don't have to be phrased or couched in terms of Buddhist terminology. Um, and the second skill, first is developing all this kind of wisdom and knowledge and the, in order to be able to teach the four truths in different ways to living beings. And then the second one is to us to be able to um, master all kinds of, oh, it's kind of, I mean, it's almost the same thing, to use the five um, fields of worldly knowledge. And this is Uming, the Panchavidya. It's an ancient Indian, I guess, classification of knowledge that includes um, grammar and composition, or language and literature, arts and mathematics, and science, medicine, logic, epistemology, and philosophy slash religion. So that's meant to cover all kinds of worldly knowledge. And um, Master uh, Tseng Guan Fa Shi, who is actually the um, Huayan Shu Zhu, he's the, the great commentator on the Abhatamsaka Sutra. Um, and he's also regarded as the fourth patriarch of the Huayan school. And um, he was a Tang Dynasty monk. 
So I just wanted to say a little bit about his life because it applies to this sutra. Um, he lived in the seven, born in 738, and some say that he lived a, a, over 100 years. But he, he started very young as a monk. He moved into a monastery by the age of nine, and after um, two years, he, was, uh, he became a novice monk. And then by 19, he was ordained. And by that time, he was also lecturing on about 14 different um, texts, either Vinaya or precept texts, sutras, shastras. And he also studied under many different masters, um, including m various Chan schools um, at that time. So he was also a Chan master, Dhyana master. And then when he was 38 years old, he made a pilgrimage to Five Peaks Mountain, or Wu Tai San, um, the holy mountain that said in China dedicated to Manjushri, Bodhisattva. And he decided to spend time there. So he ended up staying in that place for 10 years. Um, and then during that time, he reflected, well, the fifth ground Bodhisattva uh, masters worldly knowledge, the five fields of worldly, no worldly knowledge. And since he himself had been in the monastery since a young age, he didn't get the normal kind of schooling, perhaps. Um, so he, at that time, devoted time to mastering both Chinese and Indian fields of knowledge, especially philosophy, literature, history, and culture. And then when he was 45, he resolved to write a commentary on the Avatamsaka Sutra because he lamented that the previous commentaries were all um, abstruse and hard to understand. So he prepared, and, um, and then before he started, he prayed for an auspicious sign. And he had a dream that there was this huge golden man or image, and that he swallowed him. So he saw this as a sign that he was swallowing the Buddha's wisdom and then being able to share it. So he started writing, and he wrote for three years, um, basically without thinking, and um, without and there was no corrections needed after he was done. It just almost like the words flowed from his brush. So I would say that he was operating in truth in the primary sense at that time, not needing any kind of discrimination. Um, and then that was our um, Huayan, uh, Huayan um, the, f the commentary that he wrote. And then he, later on, people asked him to elaborate on that commentary. So then he wrote a sub-commentary. So the two of them are called the Shu and the Cao. And um, that to this day, it's still the authoritative commentary on the Havatamsaka Sutra. Um, so, I feel that in addition to Venerable Master, we can learn from the different patriarchs and great masters and see how they operated in worldly truth and truth in the primary sense, kind of how they were able to harmonize them. Okay, so I wanted to share a little bit about my own um, life, now down to the ordinary level. <laughs> um, I started out of course, in the world of non-Buddhist world um, throughout college. And then I learned about Buddhism and then um, moved to the monastery and stayed in the monastery for a good half of my life. Um, and then I, of course, being in the monastery was not exactly what I envisioned when I first went there, what a, a monastic does like just meditate all day under a tree or something. Like the Buddha, you know, that's the stereotypical image of the Buddha, just sitting under the Bodhi tree until he gets enlightened. Well, um, actually in the monastery, we have many opportunities to practice and learn worldly knowledge as well, because we are um, practicing both uh, blessings and developing wisdom at the same time. We have to study the sutras to learn theory, and we have to cultivate, uh, and do service, and do work, and help try to share dharma, or do other kinds of teaching, and 
other kinds of work to support the monastery. Um, so these are all parts of trying to develop these two things. And I felt that in the beginning, it was very hard for me to shift from being in the Buddha hall to being teaching in school, say, because the, the environment is so different. And the, what you're called upon to do, one is flowing out, you could say, and one is going inwards. And it seemed like I was always you know, filling myself up here and then pouring it all out here. So, but gradually, gradually, I learned how to try to hold it in, hold in that um, spiritual energy, even when I was in a setting that was very more chaotic. And I think gradually over the years, about, it developed a little bit. And at the same time, I really took advantage. We have a university called Dharma Realm Buddhist University there, so I took advantage of always being a student there and taking classes and doing some degrees there, too. Um, but finally, uh, I was recommended to leave the monastery and go into a university in the world. So that's what I have just done. And it's been a very interesting experience. <laughs> Um, to be in a very uh, surrounded by very different kinds of people and uh, activities and energy, um, it's it's I I would say for me it's a challenge in being able to combine the two sides of cultivation to be grounded in myself and in my precepts and samadhi or whatever focus I can have and at the same time to be learning skills to relate to people in the world and to know more about the, what's happening in the world. So um, it, when I read about Master Qingliang at age, you know, around my age, starting to learn about Chinese and Indian philosophy and literature and history, that was a kind of a little in encouragement that it can um, it's a good thing, and so forth. Um, not that I wanted to draw any comparison, it was just a little bit of an inspiration. Another inspiration I had was reading Master Shearing's biography, and I think around this age, um, he started to do his uh, pilgrimage across China, which is a huge endeavor, too. So. Um, in any case, let me just stop there. And are there any questions? We've been talking nonstop for a while. So are there any questions maybe about the text or any comments about combining worldly truth with truth in the primary sense? Oh, maybe I should go through the text for the third truth. Um, if you look on the second paragraph, um, in the middle, it says, Jue fa zi xiang gong xiang gu, zhi xiang di. Um, and the Chinese, I mean the English says, since he awakens to the unified reality and the common appearances of all dharmas, therefore he knows the truth of appearances. I would like to um, provide an alternate explanation um, or maybe an alternate translation, because I think it could be explained in a different way, too. I'm not sure um, Zixiang is being translated as unified reality and Gongxiang as common appearances. So um, another way is Zi and Gong. Zi is kind of like your own personal or individual and gong is the common, general, shared appearance or attribute. Xiang can also be an attribute or characteristic. So um, some have explained that zi xiang as the relating to the worldly truth, the very specific, particular kind of attributes that things or constructs have. And the gong xiang is the general characteristic. What's the general characteristic that every phenomena thing every phenomena has or can be characterized by? Can, can anyone think of something that every, yeah, 
emptiness. OK, good. So basically, emptiness, not having an, any intrinsic nature. Everything that you can perceive with your senses or hold in your mind, it's ultimately going to pass away. And, or it's dependent on everything else to come into being. <coughs> Sorry. So basically, if you say zi xiang gong xiang, he's able to um, awaken to the, this, the particular characteristics of each dharma or phenomena, and also to its shared characteristic of being empty. So this, this is what we were talking about. The fifth ground bodhisattva is particularly good at. Um, knowing that. And then there's also some analysis of, OK. So we talked about how you'd, you want to speak in worldly terms using conventional, um, understandable language to speak to someone who is not um, familiar with the Buddha Dharma and maybe has not practiced at all or learned anything. And what we would say, their, their roots are not ripe or mature. And then the second kind of truth, though, truth in the primary sense or ultimate truth, is something you can speak to somebody whose faculties are mature and ripe. They've perhaps already been cultivating for a long time, so they're about to awaken to the, see the emptiness of everything. And so you can talk to them about that, that you know, really, you don't need to be attached to your boyfriend because he's empty. <laughs> or to things that are really important to you. Actually, don't be so serious. Don't take everything so seriously. Lighten up, and things will pass, and you'll be happier that way, too. Um, a venerable master did tell, tell somebody that after a very sad breakup, with the, a partner, so this, it's okay. Don't take it so seriously. <laughs> um, or, or even like, if you're, you know, really struggling. If you're a student, you're really struggling in school. Maybe you're about to fail a class, or everyone else is doing much better than you. And if you don't take it so seriously, that oh, actually everything, like the Vajra Sutra says, it's just a dream. It's an illusion. Um, we're just playing a role, then it it's, will be more OK. And then this third kind of truth that combines the two, the individual particular kind of worldly truth with the, the ultimate truth that everything is empty, this is spoken for those beings who are confused. How can, how can things be empty? Doesn't that mean there's no cause and effect then? Meaning that you know, if Bud the Buddha did you know have this karmic law that if you do certain kind of deed, then certain kinds of um, results will will happen. So if things are empty, doesn't that mean that doesn't nothing will happen? Um, well, it's not the case. Um, because causes and effects are also empty. I mean, they're all conditioned. But they do happen in this conditioned world. Um, so, like you throw this down, it will, it will fall. It's not a very good example. But <laughs> um, this still is ultimately, it's not a permanent thing. And it doesn't have a nature of its own. So things happen, but they're like happening in a dream. And in, a, in this dream, there is cause and effect. So we do try to you know, have a better dream so that we can manage to survive enough and have some space to cultivate peacefully and until we get enough samadhi and wisdom so that we can um, be more capable of surviving in any kind of environment. Um, so, so this kind of some there are some beings who, when they hear about emptiness, they're they're like, it's they're confused because they say this is you know clearly real. How can it be empty? Um, 
and yet, if, or things are all empty, so it doesn't really matter what I do. I could go out and kill people, and there's no results. Well, there are no results, ultimately, because we're not real, but there are results. Before you, you're awakened, the results really matter. So, are there any questions or comments? Yes. So I'll just re re repeat it for people online. Um, Sarah was mentioning about, in the repentance verse, um, for all the deeds I have done, um, I repent. Um, they are done out of greed, anger, and st stupidity, and, and body, by the body, mouth, and mind. But then, um, if the mind is empty, then all offenses are gone. And so she's wondering about how that can be. It's mind-blowing and it's very, you're getting at the root of seeing the offenses as empty and eradicating that karma. So, does anyone want to comment on this? Just say that that uh, the state when of having the mind empty is a very profound state. It's not very easily achieved. Um, so it, oh, it is mind blowing, but it's something that you really have to work at. You know. Yes, repentance is, is one of the bodhisattva practices. It's one of universal worthy bodhisattvas. Um, uh, one of the things he does. So whenever we, we uh, practice a repentance ceremony, um, universal worthy bodhisattva is the repentance host. And we invoke universal worthy bodhisattva to come and, and teach us about repentance. So it's, it's a very... Um, it's a very mysterious thing. It's very mysterious. It's not something that you can sort of rationalize, but it's something that you can experience. Because um, when you, you, you practice repentance very, very sincerely and very vigorously over a long period of time, somehow you feel differently. You feel lighter. You feel happier. And, and so, you know, whether or not I can actually see my karma and see that it's there or it's not there, but I can feel a difference in my, my experience, in my state. Um, I think probably technically, um, if you investigate the Abhidharma, there's, a, there's a more of a, um, an abstract or a, or a scholarly um, explanation of what's going on but um, it is something that you, that you actually experience when you practice uh, that dharma. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it, it, it's, 
it's, a, it's a tricky topic because even the Buddha himself had to undergo karma. You remember when he, he, had, the, he had to undergo um, uh, starvation and, and a terrible headache? Um, so, you know, and he was a Buddha. So, of course, we can't really get away from our karma. Um, sometimes when I reflect on that, though, um, the way I think about it is that um, it's also talking about future karma. It's talking about our habitual energy. So when we really look in deeply into ourselves and understand why we do the things we do and, and feel a sense of deep regret and then resolve to change our habits, then basically we're cutting off that kind of karmic continuum so that in that sense we do really wipe out karma. Um, but I think something else is happening too. It's sort of like a smelting kind of thing. I really, this is, this is only a guess. I'm not, I, I have nothing to verify this, okay? But when we cultivate, uh, Shifu, Shifu um, gave us the analogy of smelting for gold. So, you know, the, the, the more you cultivate and the more intensely you cultivate and the more vigorously you cultivate, something does get lost. Impurities do somehow disappear. Um, just like when you're smelting for gold, the, 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 uh, the alloys, you know, over re reapplication, 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 the alloys then are, are gone. And what you're left with is something very pure. So um, in that sense, we can purify our karma, our karmas of body, mouth, and mind, and, and so on and so forth. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a very mysterious but wonderful process. Yeah, I think I agree with them, Masha. It's about the habits, because um, every moment you're having, you know, so many thoughts that go through your mind without barely conscious of them. And Often when we've done something that we feel regret about, we, we keep revisiting that in our minds and in our dreams. Um, so we're basically strengthening it. And then without the power of a repentance to reverse that strengthening, it just, that's how it builds into something that really weighs down on us. So um, when we can cultivate by reciting something or repenting, then we can put something else in, in its stead thought of a story, but this story is not about Shifu. Um, this story is um, uh, one time um, a group of us went to um, UBC in Vancouver, the University of British Columbia. I think uh, Dr. Verhoeven was there, and I was there. And um, we, uh, there were, you know, people coming, you know, students, um, administrators, and faculty to, to join our group. And then we broke up into little subgroups. And in the subgroup that I was in, I think Dr. Verhoeven was in that group too, if I recall. There was a, a very normal work looking woman. You know, she was wearing like a business type suit with a skirt and heels and, you know, her hair was very neat and, and uh, she looked very um, proper, you know, very, you know. And um, it turned out that she was an avid uh, meditator. She meditated every day after work. And this is reflecting back on what um, Hanginshu was saying earlier about dhyana, that it's, it's not just sitting in meditation, that it's walking, standing, sitting, and lying down. It, you know, but dhyana is something that you practice constantly. Um, so she was telling us this story about how one day in work, she lied. You know, because that happens when you're out in the world. Sometimes you find yourself having to say kind of half truth or, you know, a little white lie or something. It's good business sometimes to do it that way. And so when she got back that night and sat on her meditation cushion, she said she spent most of her time dealing with that little white lie that was bothering her. It was just really bothering her. And she realized that Diana actually doesn't start on the medication meditation cushion, it's, it's sort of, the meditation cushion is sort of like the icing on the cake. It's sort of like your, your reward for having 
done a good job that day. So, um, um, and, and you get to know from sitting in meditation the mistakes that you made that day because they come back to you. And so gradually over time, you learn to be more mindful and avoid that so that when you do sit down on the meditation cushion, you don't have to waste your time going through those things. You can, you know, get, you know, work more on getting into dhyana, into smile. Does anyone have any examples of how the Bodhisattva uses uh, worldly truth to delight the hearts of beings? Any Bodhisattvas that you know? <laughs> Sarah, do you have any stories? Shiva was really, really adept at this, and he, you know, I'm sure you must have some stories. He wouldn't do what? That, that, that reminds me of a story, okay. When I first got to the Sea of 10,000 Buddhas, I was still a lay person. I was very serious, very, very serious about cultivation. Everything was very serious. And I took myself seriously and everything seriously. It was very serious. And there were a lot of other serious people there too. And there was this, this shared truth that sugar is the, the, the cultivator's bane that if you eat sugar, you won't be able to. You'll, you'll have all kinds of false thinking. You won't be able to meditate, and on and on and on. So there was this taboo against sugar. So one day, it was very, very, very hot at CGB. You know how hot it gets on, in, this, in the middle of the summer. And Shifu invited a, a group of us to his, his uh, apartment, you know, where he lived. And I, I, I remember I was, I was perspiring profusely because I was so hot and I was really suffering from it. And I felt like I was dying of thirst, you know. And there on the, on the coffee table, Shufu had like cartons and cartons of Coca-Cola sitting there. <laughs> and I was, I was sitting there and I was just looking at the Coca-Cola and I was very serious. And I thought, no, 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 no. Cannot drink Coca-Cola, you know. And then Shufu just said, it's okay, you can drink some Coca-Cola. And, you know, and he handed me some. And I, you know, I saw how you know, sometimes, as Aginsha says, we get really too serious about ourselves. I think um, I'm really grateful to have had the opportunity to be with um, young people, teenagers, for the past 13 years. Because um, right now in my classes, there are a lot of them that are just about that age or a little older. <laughs> so I, can, I think I can relate to them better, even though I'm probably twice their age or more. <laughs> so, um, so I think I, it helped me keep a little bit more abreast of how people are what people are concerned about nowadays. And also, in, so I feel like I can relate to them okay. Um, oh, the sudden change in the environment from the monastery to the university outside. It's, um, it's very interesting because when I was in college, in the world last, I didn't know the Dharma for most of that time, and so I did a lot of um, silly or foolish things that you know were not in accord with the Dharma that later I kind of regretted, and I had to work on to really repent of things. But now that I'm 
know the precepts and everything very well, it's also a very delicate situation because I'm trying to hold these precepts in an environment that doesn't uh, really understand or um, support that very well. But at the same time, um, I want to not be too odd. So sometimes I will be a little bit flexible uh, while at the same time trying to um, just negotiate the right balance so that I'm kind of trying to combine the worldly truth with the monastic um, path um, without compromising the monastic path. So I, that's why I keep in touch with the Sangha you know, as much as possible and I try to tell them what everything that I, I'm doing um, and get feedback. Um, but in general, I feel that now that I've had some Dharma practice behind me, I feel much more comfortable. And um, I think that if I tried to do this, you know, earlier in my monastic career, it would have been much more challenging and difficult. So I feel more comfortable being very different in a, in a situation. Um, and I don't feel like it's you know, dangerous or something. It's actually very, very nice to be around people who are from very different backgrounds and they're curious. So sometimes I, I explain to them what my life is like and how I got to the university with, to be with them from a very different path than they took. Um, at the same time, there's been some things like, oh, it's already time. Um, like walking to campus, I, I see um, some beggars and also some other people who are you know, blind and wheeling themselves in a wheelchair and all kinds of different people that are very um, not fortunate. And I feel, wow, you know, they're able to struggle and make their way in the world. And um, I wish I could be of some help. And so because we have bodhisattva precepts and when people are ask you for something, you're not supposed to ignore them or say no. So I have to, I feel really bad. <laughs> um, but in appropriate cases, I will, I will try to hold my precepts and act on them um, by honoring the dignity of everybody I meet. So, okay. So, um, there are no more, oh, yes. That's a really good question. It reminds me of last week, I think Jing He said some, quoted some sticker to that effect, right? About <laughs> life is lousy and then you die. <laughs> so, um, so, um, Well, okay, so last week people also talked about um, how Buddhism is very optimistic because life isn't just about struggling and suffering, but actually that there is, you can find the bliss at when you can end the suffering. And not only you can find it for yourself, but you can, you know, make, make a vow to be able to do it, help everyone to find that happiness and that peace and serenity and, and blissful um, state of compassion and wisdom. So there is really, really, if you look at the Bodhisattva, that you could take that as your model of, you know, described in the Sutra, the Bodhisattva is so powerful and so vast and can share with everyone. Um, it's just being able to ha trust that if you follow the instructions in the Sutra, you can get from this little petty little self to, to be a bodhisattva. And I think when we see models of you know, living, being, living, living individuals like our master or different, different masters throughout history that 
have been able to manifest a bodhisattva um, lifestyle, it's, it's really, you'll find that life is really worth living and you barely have enough time to use your life to do all these things that, um, to, to cultivate yourself so that you can have the skills and the knowledge to help others. You can really make a huge difference. That's the main thing. When I was first in college, you know, I felt really depressed or because I felt like a tiny little person who could not do anything to help this world and except, you know, and everyone around me was chasing big houses and big cars and, you know, a comfortable lifestyle and the world was burning up, basically, like a burning house. So then Buddhism taught that we can make a huge difference. It's, it's not overnight. It's a long process, but if you make those vows, you'll definitely get there, and it's all in the seed. The acorn has the oak tree, so you make the huge vow from the beginning, and then you'll, you're guaranteed to eventually get there. Um, you just have to be cultivating patience <laughs> and vigor and all those paramitas until um, we get there. But the good thing is that we have lots of friends and companions that will help us along the way when we get you know, when we lose faith or get confused or um, lose energy. So, does that help answer the question? Okay. Any other comments? Yes. Good question. We were talking about our juice at CTTB, you know, it's very, very sweet. Great juice our grape juice. And we bottle it as grape juice, but it turns into champagne <laughs> by itself. Okay, so that, I mean, I mean, chemically, chemically, wine is just concentrated sugar. So if you eat a lot of sugar, you'll have a similar, your, your brain will react in a similar way. You'll get kind of very, um, uh, you'll lose your concentration and you know your mind will get very scattered and and floating like that. So yeah, it does have an effect, sugar. But the bodhisattva, it doesn't have an effect on the bodhisattva at all. Bodhisattva can eat as much sugar as he wants, and nothing will happen. The there's a bodhisattva. story. There's a story, but I can't tell it here. <laughs> <laughs> well, you just are tempting people. Is there another comment? Oh, that's great. Okay, thanks for letting me know. <laughs> okay. Well, I guess we should probably end and transfer the merit. Um, and then when we dedicate merit, you, I think you all know what we can dedicate to any particular living beings and to all living beings and to any particular causes and purposes, like not having another war, and so forth. So, may every living